In my previous video of the series, I examined just how much value an Intel Core i5 provides by testing the i5-6500 with a slew of the recently released GPUs. It performed roughly the same in all instances as the 6700K, but did fall short in some games with the higher end cards at 1080p. However, one of the questions that I sought to answer after that testing was to see if it's a variable of the clock speed difference between the i5 and the i7-6700K with nearly an entire gigahertz differential between the two chips, or if it had to do with the 6700K having two more megabytes of cache and four more threads. So in order to settle that, I took the same GPUs, same games, and used the i5-6600K of clock to 4.5 gigahertz to match the i7 to investigate the matter. And because of a faulty motherboard, I had to perform the overclock benchmarks a second time. So with a total of 630 benchmarks under my belt for this video, I feel very confident with my conclusions. So hopefully with all of my testing, I can answer two questions here. Firstly, can overclocking an i5 give you better performance with regards to gaming over a standard i5? And then secondly, is the 6600K as good as the 6700K in this instance? Following are the prodigious amounts of benchmarks I did to answer the questions. I'll do my best to simplify the data, but a myriad of benchmarks was necessary to get as broad a picture as possible. Feel free to pause the video whenever you need to scope the data out further. The test system was run with 16 gigabytes of RAM at 2400 MHz. The graphics cards used were the RX 460, RX 470, and RX 480 on the AMD side. And on the Nvidia side, there was the GTX 1063 and 6 gigabyte editions, GTX 1070 and GTX 1080. So looking at Ashes of the Singularity first, compared directly to the i7-6700K, nearly every card in every resolution with either the DirectX 11 or DirectX 12 runtime performs about the same with the i5-6600K. The only anomalous result came with the GTX 1063GB and DirectX 12 at both 1080p and 4K and only slightly at 1440p. This also means that the 6600K outshines its turbo clock restricted i5 brethren. Deus Ex unsurprisingly shows no difference amongst the cards as well. However, this game also let the 6500 match the performance of the 6700K, so not much to comment on here. All resolutions and APIs are roughly in line with each other. Grand Theft Auto V has shown to be relatively dependent on the CPU's performance in my previous videos, and the 6600K shows that it has to do more with clock speeds than extra threads. However, while at 1080p, the GTX 1080 gains an extra 16 FPS over the 6500, but it still is down 6 FPS from the pure power that the 6700K allows. At anything above 1080p though, the 6600K appears to be just as good with the GPUs being the bottleneck rather than the CPU. Hitman at 1080p and DX11 shows the same idea as with Grand Theft Auto. The GTX 1070 and 1080, and even the RX 480 to some extent, gain FPS with an overclocked i5, but still come short of what the 6700K provides. DX12 eliminates the differential with the RX 480, but the 1070 and 1080 still get hurt a bit with a lower thread count and cache. At 1440p, the GTX 1080 still is restricted by a few FPS in both DirectX 11 as well as in DirectX 12. And at 4K, everything's copacetic. No surprise there. Metro Last Light is a game that performs the same on the i5-6500 as it does on the 6700K, so overclocking the 6600K does nothing to any of the GPUs. Every card performs within a margin of error regardless of the type of quad-core CPU that was on the system. Rise of the Tomb Raider shows that the limitations that the 6500 had were due to clock speed. The 6600K essentially closes the gap to the 8-threaded proc at 1080p with even the highest-end GPU. At 1440p, the GTX 1080 is a bit less restricted with the higher clock speed. At 4K, again, there's no difference at all between any of the CPUs. So the data is pretty clear. For gaming, the 6600K is better than the i5-6500. However, it's not always on par with its 8-threaded counterpart, even when it's OC'd clock for clock. 
So that answers the two questions that I proposed at the beginning of the video. Overclocking the i5 is better, but it's not the same as an i7. However, not to end the video there and to take the discussion just a step deeper, is it worth it? I think there are two ways to answer that question. From a strictly financial perspective, the i5-6500 is a much better bargain than picking up the 6600K. With a cost difference of roughly 12% in the US on Newegg and 17% here in South Africa, it's straight up not worth it on a chip-to-chip -chip basis. The largest gain that was seen by the 6600K was 13% in Grand Theft Auto V at 1080p with the GTX 1080. Everything else was significantly less than that. That 12 and 17% price difference is only taking into account the price difference between the CPUs, which isn't everything you'd have to worry about if you decide to pick up a 6600K. You'd have to spend more on a motherboard by making sure that you pick up a Z-series chipset board, which granted may not be too much depending on what features you want in a motherboard, because there are some Z170 boards that go for cheaper than some B150s. And then there's also the added cost of a CPU cooler as Intel no longer includes them with K-series chips. And even if you pick up a $20 cooler, that's still 10% additional cost to the overall setup versus the 6500. And then there's still even the possibility, albeit a less likely one, that you might need to upgrade your power supply to handle the increased wattage demands that you're inflicting on your system by overclocking the chip. Couple that all up and you could be paying 20 to 30% more to get the 6600K over the 6500, which even with the GTX 1080 isn't a great value proposition. However, I mentioned that there were two ways to answer the question of is it worth it? The strictly financial one paints the 6600K as a fool's errand. The second way is a bit kinder to the 6600K. So in my day of riding motorcycles, I've been on everything from lowly 250cc bikes to 1000cc superbikes. And while bikes with massive engines offer little in the way of full practicality since legally no one is going to be doing 200 miles per hour on the road, they explain why an unlock processor is worth it. My main motorcycle for the past four years has been of the 250cc variety, whether that be the CBR from Honda or the GPR from Big Boy. They were economical, getting 70 or so miles per gallon, and they had enough pep to get around town and keep up with the quickest of traffic. And they made a lot of financial sense. But their fatal flaw, the downfall of the small engine bike, is that they're always maxed out. Keeping up with traffic on the highway means I'm nearly at the red line all the time. And if I need to pull away quickly, I can't. I'm stuck. I'm fodder for the rest of the cagers. Roadkill instantly. The peace of mind that comes with having a bigger engine bike and being able to pull away when you need to is worth the extra cost that comes with the upfront purchase of the bike, but also with the decreased fuel economy. And that, my friends, is what can make an unlocked CPU worth it, even if the finances aren't in line with that idea. You have headroom. Sure, you don't need it all the time for your typical tasks, but it's there. It's reassuring to know that when the next generation of games come along and start utilizing your CPU more and your stock i5 speeds are starting to hinder your system, you can kick it up a notch and pull out that little bit of extra performance that's been stowed away for so long ever since the Supreme Kai locked it away in that stupid cocoon. The benefit of a K-series chip isn't that it's automatically better for gaming or in all instances, but rather it's less easy to hinder when the going gets tough. And that is something that can't readily be quantified with financial numbers. And with that, I'd like to take this moment to thank Wootware for being amazing and sponsoring all of the hardware that I needed to make this video series possible. From the CPUs to all the GPUs, Wootware has been invaluable to both the video series but also my personal computer needs. If you're in South Africa, you should absolutely check out Wootware for whatever your rig desires are. Even if it may be too late for some holiday shopping, Wootware has some fantastic deals going on year round, as well as absolutely amazing customer service to match their affordable prices. From Pentium CPUs to GTX 1080 GPUs and everything in between, you should head on over to wootware.co.za to begin wooting up your life. The link will be in the video description. And that's going to wrap it up for this video, as well as my deep dive CPU series. Let me know how you guys liked it. Is there anything I overlooked, overstated, or was completely wrong on? If you did like it, do you have any ideas for future series going forward? I do really appreciate all your support on my videos, whether that be likes or dislikes, compliments, or even criticisms. I'm hoping that we'll hit the 10,000 subscriber mark soon because I am desperate to get rid of this hair on my head and this ferret on my face. And I guarantee you that it's bothering me more than it is you. So whatever comments you have, trust me, I have them all. 
but it's all staying until I hit 10,000 subscribers. But enough of that. I'll see you guys in the next video. Cheers.